Hello. So let me just start this. Hello. So my name's Matt Hamilton, and uh, this is a talk about basically about my past year working with uh, iOS developers rather than Plone. Some of you may know me uh, from the Plone community. Uh, you may have seen me last year organizing the Plone conference exactly a year ago. And for the past 15 years, roughly before then, I was the technical director of a company in Bristol, NetSite. And leading up to that, uh, I had a number of uh, things going on at, at, at home and with family, and uh, decided that I needed to go and do something completely and utterly different. And whilst I would love to have just sat in a field and meditated or, or stared at butterflies for a year or something, mortgages need to be paid and things, the bills need to be paid and stuff. So I decided to try and do something very different. Now, uh, the gentleman in the middle there, Wynn, uh, some of you may know, had invited me to come and work for a company called Enquos. And uh, as well there in that picture is uh, Silvio Tomatis, uh, some of you may know as well from Italy, from Abstract and uh, Gisson Web. And uh, also, who's not in that picture, another former Plone uh, community member, a guy called Kai Lataporti from Hexagon IT in Finland. So I started working for this company called Enquos. And what is Enquos? Enquos is the first system to combine the tracking of nutrition, health, and fitness data so that insights can be made into day-to-day -day actions and health outcomes. It's completely integrated, consolidating the functions of multiple applications. So we're bringing in data from various different places and allowing you to see it. So a lot of people will be aware of existing apps for tracking things like running or cycling, things like MyFitnessPal, Strava, RunKeeper, and trackers, things like Fitbits or, or, or Garmin's devices strapped to your wrist or ankle or bike computers that monitor what you're doing. And uh, a now fairly famous quote by a management consultant called Peter Drucker, who said, what measures improves, and that's been applied to so many different aspects of industry and of life, and in this case it's being applied to health with the idea of measuring your health, you can improve it. And that can be for various different reasons. Uh, maybe you're an athlete and you're looking to improve your sports performance. Maybe you're someone who just wants to lose a little bit of weight. Maybe you're somebody who is dealing with a chronic illness or trying to manage a condition like diabetes or a kidney, kidney issue. So Encourse uses a lot of familiar technologies to many people here. Uh, we do use Plone. Our help center is all based on Plone. Our main website is built on Pyramid, but our back-end development is all, all in Python. We use Elasticsearch for the search. Uh, all of our data is in Cassandra, which is a uh, back-end database that we use, clustered database. And we're using a lot of the same tools for the development, things like GitHub. A couple of just screenshots from, from Enquos, the, the web system. So you can get various things like analytics. So you can actually analyze various aspects. Um, here you can look at things like your calorific intake over time, breaking that down to things like fats, carbohydrates. You can track things like supplements, vitamins, protein supplements, that sort of thing. And we, as well, uh, track things like, uh, or allow you to track food via meal plans. So you can actually create meal plans, or it can suggest meal plans for you, for what you might want to eat. So our test infrastructure, um, you're not meant to really necessarily be able to see this, but the point to take away is that is 32 different uh, cores, or threads rather, CPU threads at the top. This is a, an output from top, showing what's going on in one of our test infrastructures, uh, test servers. We have four of these servers running. Well, I, I think actually I'm out of date. I think it's, it's five now. But we have something like 128 CPU threads with over half a terabyte of RAM across four, well, now five servers. And a test suite broken down into about 60 segments. And at any one time, there'll be between about 10 and 16 Docker instances, each running a piece of the test suite. And it takes about 20 minutes 
for the test suite to run. Uh, we use robot test uh, framework similarly to Plone. So taking some of the technologies, this is all before I joined um, Enquos. But taking all the same technologies that we use within the Plone community and using them for uh, testing the, the whole system. Now, when I joined Enquos, the mobile app was in development. I wasn't actually anything to do with the mobile team originally. They originally asked me to come and join them to work on the business development side and to be talking to partner companies about how Enquos could be integrated on a technical level with other systems. So things like insurance systems, other healthcare systems, um, gym management systems. And uh, that's what I originally was going to be doing with them. But the relationship with the third party company that was building the, the app started to break down. And uh, I was brought in just at the end of that relationship to try and see how we could make it better. And in the end, it was decided to part ways and we were going to build the apps in house. So I was then thrown from my nice, comfortable world of doing sort of web technologies and a bit of business development into the world of mobile. And there starts this curious, curiouser and curiouser journey. So I started off, one of the first things I ended up doing was going to a conference, a conference called NSConf. Uh, NS is a prefix you see a lot within Apple development, actually stands for Next Step, which is where a lot of the Apple stuff originally came from. And NSConf was a conference, not unlike Plone Conference, about 300 people from across the globe uh, in the UK. But what was very strange to me is I've been in the Plone community now since the Plone community was born. I've been to pretty much every Plone conference there has been, apart from the very first one. I've organized sprints, uh, conferences, sat on the foundation board, you know, been on mailing lists, uh, and all sorts of things. And I know a lot of people within the Plone community. I know 50% of the people here at this conference. Um, there's probably more than that that recognize me from standing on front of a stage. But here I am walking into a conference that I know absolutely no one at all. No, sorry, one person, randomly, I know. But I don't know anybody there. I don't speak the technical language. I don't know any of the in-jokes or the personalities or the people that are there. If somebody said to me here, oh, you know, Eric has just done this or whatever, I, I know who they're probably talking about, Eric Steele, the release manager, or if they mention Lee Me, who was one of the founders of Plo, and I, I, I know that. But when they stand there and said, hey, you know, Bob's just going to work for so-and-so now, who's Bob? No idea. So it was a bit of an eye-opener going into a new community as a complete newbie and learning about that community. It was a very humbling experience and thinking about what people must be coming into the Plone community thinking and, and you know, started my brain thinking about what sort of things we can improve upon within the Plone community in terms of approachability. Now, I don't know the technical language of iOS development. So it's, there's two languages that Apple use, Objective-C, which is the older one, and Swift, which is a new one that's just come in. And I thought, well, you know, I'm a clever guy. I've got a degree in computer science, software engineering. I program in Python. I've done previously Java. I've done C, etc. So surely I should be able to pick up another language, right? It should be pretty easy to do it. But it wasn't so much the language that I had an issue with. It was the whole ecosystem around it. It was the APIs. So just uh, this is just a sample of the, I don't know, 200 or so different APIs that Apple have for different things. So if I want to store some data so that it is persisted and I can get it back the next time I start up the app, well, how do I do that? Well, that's a system called Core Data. What if I want to access the motion sensor and find out whether a phone is moving? What if I want to take a photo with a camera? One of the things about mobile devices is, of course, they're so much more personal to a user they have a much richer context than, say, a desktop or even a laptop device. You know, is this device in somebody's pocket? Are they walking down the street with it? Are they trying to take a photo? Do they have um, the camera switched on or off? Do they have the flash on? We had a situation where, um, jumping ahead a little bit, but we had a situation where in one of the first versions of our app, um, you, could, you could take a photo of the of food you were logging. So the app I was working on, the first app was to allow you to log your nutritional intake. So you could say, okay, I've had a coffee and a donut and whatever, and it tells you how many calories, how much fat, protein over time. 
and you can take a photo because we thought, okay, great feature was you don't necessarily want to log it all now, you just want to take a photo and come back to it and fill it in later while you're not busy eating and socializing. And we tested this um, we tested this feature, just going in, gone into the, into the build. We had a development build. I was sat in a very, very, very nice restaurant in Los Angeles where the company is based, been taken out by the CEO, um, and we were sat in this fairly exclusive steakhouse they'd, they'd booked us a table in, and I thought, well, I'm gonna test the app. I can't take it. The app had switched the, the, the flash back on. I always have the flash off on my phone, and the app had switched back on. I didn't realize, so in the middle of this very nice restaurant, bam, the flash goes off in, the, in, a, in a fairly dark setting. Um, luckily, I, I, it started the sort of pre-flash, and I got my hand over it before the main flash came out. But you've got to be aware of these, these things. Um, slight digression, but. So learning all the different APIs, learning about the actual tools that are used. This is Xcode. This is the IDE that's used um, predominantly. There, there are other IDEs. There's another very good one uh, called AppCode by the JetBrains people who also make uh, a Python, good Python IDE. But how do, you, how do you use it? You know, I sit down in front of it, and it's like, okay, so which button do I press to compile something? Um, okay, so I'll press the play button, and something happens, uh, and it, a different thing happens depending on whether my phone's plugged in or not. Uh, there are different what are called schemes um, that, that are kind of like different build-out configurations. So in build-out, you might have, say, a production and a test build-out file, and schemes are a bit like that, allowing you to have different things happen. Uh, how does the debugger work? How do I set breakpoints? How do I step through the code? What can I actually see in a debugger? I'm used to Emacs and a command line, and going into an environment in which I have this very rich tool was, again, quite alien. And the way in which I was working. So for the last 15 odd years, I've been in a room at NetSite, one room with all of the people in one room. And I'm now moved to a much more virtual environment. I know a lot of people within the Plone community work this way. You know, if you, if you scale things up, the Plone community works this way. But it was, it was slightly strange, sat on my own, um, in my own room, and with everybody being remote. But it was, it was good. It was, uh, it was a very enjoyable change, being able to say, right, I'm gonna put this pot plant here, and I'm gonna put this bookcase here, um, and I don't have to worry about anybody else. It's just my environment, and I can let people in when I switch the webcam on and off. But the actual app development process, Again, this was, a, this was a new thing. How do you actually go about going from an idea, going from some code, to going to something that's actually running on a device? This was a whole alien concept to me as to how this process actually works. And it's not, it's not that easy. Uh, so Apple are extremely careful with who can run applications on a phone. And up until recently, you would say, well, this is for security reasons. Um, some of you may have seen in the news there's been a big issue with some compromised versions of Xcode that uh, then resulted in some, a number of compromised applications. But the point that they try and do is they try and protect the user by restricting what can run. And so there's a whole series of steps around digital signatures and certificates that you have to go through. So there's certificates, there's keys, there's provisioning profiles which tie things together. Um, things called bundle IDs, app IDs, schemas I've, I've kind of mentioned, configurations. There's a whole series of things. Now the first build that I tried to do took me, I don't know, about a week. Uh, one, of, one of the developers we were working with had, had you know, been doing some work, got it all working and everything. I've checked it out from GitHub, I've got it there in Xcode, and it took me about a week to actually compile it and get it so that I could distribute it to somebody else to be able to use. And I'll go into a bit more of that as we go along, but it's, a, it's an incredibly complex process. And I couldn't find a kind of a dummy's guide to how to do this. So I kind of started blogging about it, uh, hopefully of use to some other people. And one of the reasons why I was blogging about it is 
because I wanted to automate the process. Yes. One thing I've learned through the Plum community is automated builds really are a good thing. You know, we have build out, we use within the Plum community, we use tools like Jenkins and Travis to do automated builds, and they're fantastic. But how do you do that in a world where people are most used to a, a, an IDE and clicking buttons to, to fix things? And I started to get this, this imposter syndrome feeling. I moved very quickly from complete and utter bewilderment to this sort of feeling of, well, who am I to work this out? Um, you know, I don't know anything about app development, and I'm starting to blog about this and say, hey, this is how to do it. And it felt, felt a little uneasy. And then I remembered there was a, a very good chart. I don't actually have it in here, but you know, the, the idea being is you think you know sort of this sphere of information, and you think everybody else knows something completely different, but actually there's an overlap. As you, as you go along. And you might know a little bit of what everybody else knows. And they might know a little bit of what you know. But just because they know a little bit doesn't mean that they know everything. Now, they may know a whole lot about one particular subject, but not much about another. So you can always bring something. You've always got experiences that can bring something to the table. Even if the experience is coming in as a complete newbie, like I did, and say, well, how does this work? And somebody says, well, I don't know. I just press the button. Well, have you ever thought about how it works? And you know, you can, you can start to bring in, um, bring in some insight or get people to actually think about it. So the iOS build process is long, arcane. It requires variations in the build process because you're building to different devices, different environments, and it requires digital signatures, keys, and certificates. So if I want to build an app locally, I can open Xcode. I can plug my phone, I have to plug my phone in via USB cable to my laptop, and I can write hello world, and I can hit a button, it will compile it, it will install it on my phone, and it will run, and I can, I can show it to you. Now that's all great, but what if somebody else now wants to run my code? If I want to be able to distribute it to, to one of you to run on your phone? Now what's happened behind the scenes is that the app has actually been signed by my developer certificate. When you start doing iOS development, you sign up for a developer certificate with Apple. And that certificate is what's used to sign the app on your device. And that is tied to your device. So when you, when you build it in what's called the provisioning profile that it generates automatically is the, what's called the UDID, unique de device identifier of your device encoded in there. So I can't just give that binary build to somebody else because it won't run on their phone because their phone will check it and say, no, -uh, that's not to run on this device. That's only to run on Matt's iPhone. So if you want to distribute it, you need a third party service to distribute it. Well, there's a, an, another way called enterprise deployment in which you can deploy it another way. But generally, you need to distribute it using a, a third party service. And there's a number of them out. There's one called Test Flight, which uh, Apple uh, bought recently. There's one called Hockey, uh, which I think Microsoft bought recently. But there's a number of these third party services. But in order to build, do a build that can be uploaded to that service, you have to sign the app with the key certificate pair for your company. So I might have that key certificate pair on my laptop, but what about the next developer who's working with me? Well, they need to have it on their laptop or desktop, and so does the next one, and so does the next one. And that quickly becomes a bit of a security nightmare because those are the keys that determine who can release an app publicly into the App Store with your name on it. So, you know, it seemed to me to be a bit strange that how, how do you manage this process? And you'd have different builds because you might want a debugging build that has certain extra features switched on, the ability to switch between, say, a production and a staging server for your back-end API so you can see test data, or that would bring up additional information as you're using it to help you debug what's going on. And for each of those builds, we have to have the, we have to know in advance the user's UDIDs for their phones. So what we have to do is we have to say, okay, who is going to test this app? All of these people here. So if I wanted to distribute it to everybody in this room, I would have to get you to register, and I would have to get the long serial number from each of your devices 
before I build the app, before I distribute it. And if I do that now, and then somebody walks into this room in five minutes' time and they want to use it, I've got to build it again because I've got to recreate the provisioning profile with their UDID in and rebuild it, which is all a bit of a pain. If I want the app to end up in the app store so that somebody can download it and, and you know, find it, I have to submit it to Apple. Now, Apple then review it, and they've got a, a, a review time of somewhere between you know, roughly eight, and t eight, eight to 10 days review time. So if I submit it today, you won't be able to actually download it and, and use it for eight to 10 days time. If this is going in the App Store, the, the ad hoc builds I showed earlier, if I know your device ID, I could do it sooner. But if I were to put it to the general public who I don't know, it takes eight to 10 days. So this makes a big impact on your development schedule. So say you're doing some development, the sort of yellow bars, you've got some testing, the green bars, and then you've got a whole lot of waiting around, which are the blue bars. So you've got to be thinking, okay, if I'm creating this app, I'm going to release it, I'm not going to start getting feedback from the general population for another 10 days. I better get this right, because if I screw this build up, and it goes through there, and they then release it, I've then got to wait another 10 days from now to fix that mistake I've just made. So it's, it's, a, it's a nasty process when you think about it. And you know, I'm used to the web stuff. You know? it, it's like I can make a change in my build-out config. I can rerun it, and everybody suddenly has the new change because there's no local state. So I started working on an automated build system. I remember Eric Steele once talking about the process he goes through to release Plone, and he started writing it up on some flip charts. This is at um, Plone Open Garden, I think it was. And I think he covered about three or four sheets of paper on this flip chart, going through all the steps he needed to do. Um, and even that's with a fairly automated process. So I wanted to say, OK, how can we make this even better? Luckily, I found a tool called Fastlane. Fastlane is, I suppose, the iOS equivalent of build-out written by a uh, guy called Felix Krauss, and uh, it allows you to automate the builds. You can have multiple what he calls lanes, which are, so you might have a development lane, you might have a production build lane, um, and so those are similar to, say, your different build-out CFG files that you might have. It gives you an API to iTunes Connect. iTunes Connect is where you interface with Apple in uploading builds. And traditionally, that's done through the web. So you've got to go through, edit all the metadata, the title, the description, screenshots. So you can upload five screenshots of an app. Well, we support four different iPhone models, the 4S, the 5 stroke 5S, the 6, the 6 Plus. Well, we've now got there's the 6S, the 6S Plus that now just come along. So that's six different screen resolutions. And you've got to upload five photos at six different screen resolutions. That's just English. Now say we want to localize it for German or Italian or whatever. The number of screenshots starts to become huge. You've got to upload each of those. So Fastlane has some tools to help automate the screenshot process as well, which is pretty cool. So similar to, say, robot framework in which you're driving the, the system, you can do the same thing with Fastlane. And um, it can drive uh, Apple's uh, automator service, which uses the accessibility uh, identifiers within the app to be able to locate particular bits. So tap on the button marked this, or go to the area of the screen marked this, and swipe from this point to this point. And like I said, it has a configuration file. So I can, I can put in here all the different bits and pieces that I need uh, and the different steps. It's written in Ruby. Um, it's one of the things that I really still can't get my head around is Ruby. I, I really don't like Ruby. Ruby allows you to create domain-specific languages that look like Ruby, but that are not Ruby. So every time you see something like this, you think, is it actually Ruby, or is it a domain-specific language, and what does it actually do? So it's, it's, it is a bit, bit strange. One day I'll get my head around it. But it allows me here to select a provisioning profile, to do some logic as to whether or not this is a release build or a, a staging build. 
um, set what's called the app identifier. So each app has an identifier. So in our case, uh, com.ncross.nutrition. And each unique app on the device needs an app identifier. Now we have Jenkins then firing this off. So I've got a number of jobs there. Uh, the jobs marked pod. Pod is like a, um, a package, like an egg in Python terms. So we've created some pods for some of the common elements. And then we've got a couple of build jobs. So we've got a nutrition, we've got a store build, uh, we've got what's called the feature branch build, and we've got a develop build. Now going back to those app IDs, one of the things that I've done which is really cool is we create, we dynamically within that build out configuration in here, we create the app identifier automatically based upon the branch that the code is in, in GitHub. So we use a thing called git flow, and git flow is just a sort of a consistent naming convention for, for wh how you use git. And so any bit of feature development work has a feature branch. And so what we do is we end up generating specific apps for each feature branch. So here you can see one. So there's one there for the glucose list view that we put in. Um, barcode scanner improvements, small fixes, some, some various bits and pieces, teeny tiny typos. So each one of these has its own build and is available to install on the phone. So the way our development workflow works is pretty cool now. We use Slack. Again, one of the things I, I, I loved from working in the open source community was IRC. We used IRC extensively, have done for what, 20, 25 years within, within the open source community. And within IRC, we've had bots, the CIA bots that do the check-ins and things like that, uh, report them. So Slack is like IRC with a slightly prettier face on it and a number of integrations. So these are some screenshots from the Slack uh, mobile app, actually. So we can see here GitHub has reported that there has been a check-in. One of our developers, Ben, has checked in some stuff on a feature branch, uh, the weak view integration. And he's just mentioned on the right there, uh, this is sequential, so it's mentioned on the right. Push some changes, definitely looks cleaner. Matt and Russ, uh, Hockey app should update soon. Hockey is one of the third party services we use for distribution. Russ is very happy, he's our UX guy, so he's very happy that there's some UX changes. I've said, we'll check it out. And then down the bottom here we could see, so uh, 12 minutes later, there's a build that's come out. And so we could see here, Fastlane has said there's a build. It's from the weak view integration branch. There's the download link. So because I'm on my phone here looking at this, I can tap on that download link. It's got a what's new and tells me the commit log. I can click on that link and I will have it installed there and then on my phone. So this is a feature branch. This is before it's even been merged into the developer branch or into the master uh, tree. So I can check out individual bits of work that's been done. I've had a look at it. I've even taken a screenshot directly on the phone, uploaded it again via the Slack app, and given my feedback. And so that's all within, that's, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing that on my phone, um, doing that testing and feedback all entirely via my phone, which allows for very fast feedback cycles, fast in mobile app terms, when, when it takes a while to actually do something. To the point where, um, I was at a gig in Bristol. Uh, in the background there is a 30-ton fire-breathing metal spider made out of recycled aircraft parts. Uh, it was cool. If you see the pictures when it gets later uh, and there's the lasers and the fire, it's pretty awesome. But the back-end team had just done some, pushed some changes to the API that we were waiting on, and I needed to give some feedback. And uh, because of the time zone differences, uh, it would be really cool if I could have given that feedback sort of there and then. I get a notification that the change has happened. I can load up the app, and lo and behold, I can see live data now. Beforehand, those bar graphs at the bottom were all blank. And uh, I can see the live data, I can give the feedback, and I can immediately submit it, which is, which is great. So another sort of story along those lines uh, are one of our directors, Nicole, she's, our, she's a registered dietitian, and she was at a conference, and she'd said, 
uh, okay, I'm going on to this conference, I'd like to show off the app. So we, we did a build uh, for her through Apple's uh, distribution service called Test Flight. And she was at the app, uh, at the expo, she had the app, and uh, I went to bed that evening. Uh, she was nine hours uh, earlier in her day. And I woke up in the morning, grabbed my phone, the first thing in the morning, checked my phone. Message from Nicole, there's an error in the data. Uh, two of the labels are transposed. Oh, right. I'm literally getting out of bed at this point. I've got the phone. I raise a ticket in uh, Pivotal, which is our issue tracker. Raise a ticket in Pivotal. Uh, I ping one of our developers, Mark, who's an hour ahead of me. He's already started work. He's an hour ahead of me. I said, hey, Mark, look, there's an issue here. Can you check this out? He checks it out. Sure enough, two of the labels had been transposed in the code. We've been looking at this for months, but we're not dietitians. The numbers looked OK to us. We didn't realize that we had them back to front. He commits a change, sends a message back saying, OK, change is done. And I jump in the shower, start having a shower. By the time I come out of the shower, the phone's, the phone's by the side there. Uh, it's beeped. There's a new update. So our build server has gone ahead in the background, built the app from the change that he's done on GitHub. I can then download it, check it. Yep, that looks fine. Merge to master. He goes ahead, merges it to master. Then about a half an hour later, you know, <coughs> finish brush my teeth, getting breakfast, whatever, I get a notification that a new build is available through test flight, and I know that Nicole will wake up in the morning a few hours later with that new build and that fix, which is, which is awesome. It's great to have that speed of development. So kind of things I've learned in the past year on this. So don't take for granted having control of the whole process. This is something I missed from the Plone days and something I did take for granted. So I mentioned you submit something to Apple. So there we go. Uh, Dear Legacy Parts Corporation, the legal name of, the, of Enquos, um, the following app has changed to waiting for review. So we've submitted it. It's waiting for review. Now we start our, uh, our, our, our wait, our 10-day wait. Whilst we're waiting, this happens. Apple release iOS 9. Great. While our app's in the review queue. Now, we knew it was coming at some point. We didn't know exactly when they were going to release it. We'd done a little bit of testing on the, on the beta versions, but we still, you know, the final version wasn't out. Not only that, but they released a whole new developer tools. We were using Xcode 6.4. They've just released Xcode 7. Now, Xcode 7 includes the new version of Swift, Swift 1.2. So iOS 8 to 9. Xcode 6.4 to 7, Swift 1.2 to 2, there was incompatibilities. Swift 2 had some new reserved words in the language that clashed with some reserved words that one of the libraries we were using used. So we couldn't upgrade. We had to stick with using this old version. Now, meanwhile, Apple are pushing us going, hey, look, you know, update, update, update. We're sort of holding off because we can't, we can't update yet. And we're entirely beholden to that. We, we actually, there was actually a bug. We had to pull the, the, the app from the review queue because we found that there was a bug. As soon as iOS 9 came out, there was a bug in the last version before the, between the beta and the last general release that affected our code, a very subtle one. Uh, then we were getting some crashes, so we had to pull it and resubmit it. And that's not a nice position to be in, to be, have everything whipped out from under your feet you know, whilst you're working on it. Swift, I've started to look at. Uh, Swift is Apple's code, uh, new, new programming language. And if you, if you kind of squint, it looks a bit like Python. Um, ben Ackland here has written a, a good sort of blog post on NetSite's blog, which uh, talks about the sort of Swift from a, a, a Python developer's point of view. So I'm, I'm starting to, to learn that. I've actually registered on a, a, a course, Coursera course online to, to sort of go through all of that. It's a little bit late now in my, in my process. I wish it was six months earlier, but still uh, catching up on the bits I've missed on. So imposter syndrome is real. That's one thing I've learned. Um, you know, when people talk about coming into new communities, it's something we need to work on, I think, as any community, how to welcome people. Friendly communities really rock. Lack of virtualization really sucks. So we've got a couple of Mac minis that the build servers run on because we can't virtualize it because it has to be run on Apple hardware. 
good documentation is great. The Apple documentation generally is really good. There's some really good videos from the uh, Apple developer conferences. And I still don't understand Ruby. But I went along to uh, NSConf, I mentioned, knowing nobody. Uh, I came away hiring two developers. So that was you know, a fantastic, fantastic conference. And one of them who's worked with a lot of, um, a, a couple of uh, well-known banks in the UK working on their mobile app, said to me, you know, this is the best CI and build system she's ever seen, the one that I put together from somebody who didn't know anything about iOS development. So it's, you know, and at first I was thinking, well, what do you mean? I don't know what I'm doing here. Um, I'm, I've just registered on a course to learn the programming language, but it, transferring some stuff over has been, been, been really cool. Um, I can show you the app in a bit, but it looks a little bit like this, just give you a flavor. There's a, uh, the ability to log your water on one side uh, on there, and the other side is, is logging your nutrition. So this is what we've sort of finally come out with. But that's it. Um, so thank you very much, and hopefully uh, it's been of interest. Any questions? No? Anybody still awake? Everybody's falling asleep. Okay, well, thank you very much. And if anybody wants to know more, then come find me later.